Good afternoon. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at the Apache International Conference 2021 in the Pediatric Symposium on Pediatric Allergies. And my title of the talk today will be on anaphylaxis, Asian versus Western perspectives. I have no relevant conflicts of interest to declare. This is the outline of my talk. The first topic I'll be speaking on is the epidemiology of pediatric anaphylaxis, comparing East and West. And then I will move on to discuss some time trends in anaphylaxis, anaphylaxis outcomes and management, as well as to cover some unique allergens that are present in Asian countries. So first off, I would like to discuss some of the papers on epidemiology of anaphylaxis from different countries, East and West. So this shows um, some of the studies from Hong Kong, Japan, Korea, Taiwan, and Thailand, which are representative of the studies in Asia on anaphylaxis. As you can see, the study designs are usually retrospective, and they can be in settings like emergency department records or from claims and um, other databases in the national health registries. Some of the studies covered pediatric patients, whereas others involved a whole range of adult and pediatric populations. The anaphylaxis incidence rates that were reported varied considerably between studies. Some of them reported it in 100,000 person years, whereas others reported them in the form of percentages. So these are some of the studies that were performed in Western populations, such as Europe, Australia, Canada, and UK. Again, here you see that some of them were systematic reviews or cross-sectional or prospective studies, and some of them would cover the whole range of pediatric and adult populations, whereas others were focused only on the pediatric populations. And here, there are also variable reporting for the anaphylaxis incident rates. So overall, we found that there was a lot of variability in reporting styles and study designs between Asian as well as Western populations. However, the rates between East and West appear to be quite comparable. Australia, quite interestingly, has one of the highest incidences of anaphylaxis in the world, especially in children. This slide shows some of the food triggers in Asian children that are uh, for anaphylaxis in the various age groups. As you can see, seafood is one of the major allergens causing anaphylaxis in Asian children. And other possible allergens that have been causing anaphylaxis in this age group includes cow's milk, peanuts, as well as egg. Interestingly, wheat is an emerging allergen in countries like Thailand as well as Japan. However, in stark contrast, countries in the West, such as Europe, United States, and Canada, peanuts and tree nuts are the top allergens in these countries, whereas wheat allergy, allergy is rare as a cause of anaphylaxis. Looking at drug triggers of anaphylaxis in children, the main triggers in both Eastern and Western populations are antibiotics, particularly beta-lactams, as well as non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There are no major differences in triggers between Eastern and Western. I'm now going to share some data from the Apapari anaphylaxis, uh, anaphylaxis Registry. This was a registry that was set up about two years ago, involving several countries in Asia. The first three countries which uh, were able to present preliminary data are compiled here, Hong Kong, Singapore, and Bangkok. This study was con conducted prospectively over a one to one and a half year period across several pediatric tertiary centers in the three countries. The estimated incidence rate of anaphylaxis was around 7.7% in Hong Kong, and 10.4% in Singapore. The data from Bangkok is still pending at this time. Looking at triggers in the Upper Pari countries, Bangkok, Singapore, and Hong Kong, food was one of the major causes of anaphylaxis in Asia children. And this is followed by drug-induced anaphylaxis. Insect venom anaphylaxis was exceedingly rare. Now discussing food anaphylaxis triggers in the three countries. As you can see here, shellfish was the most common allergen overall. And this was followed by egg. Wheat is again a prominent allergen in countries like Thailand, but it's not as common in other countries like Hong Kong and Singapore. Tree nuts, peanut, fish and soy were much less common as allergens in this part of the world. Moving on to time trends in anaphylaxis, this data shows trends in 
nephylaxis over one to two year decades in Western populations. As you can see, there was a significant increase in the incidence of anaphylaxis in most of the countries and a doubling of the rates in different decades. Anaphylaxis admissions are highest in Australia. The diagram on the left shows the rates of food-induced hospital anaphylaxis admissions over a 10-year period from 1994 to 2005. The rates of anaphylaxis admissions increased significantly, especially in the youngest age group, children aged 0 to 4 years. And on the diagram on the right, there is an increase in the anaphylaxis ED visits in the US population over the same 10-year period time trends in anaphylaxis in Asia. Similar to the Western populations, the rates of anaphylaxis have increased significantly over the past two decades. And this is similar to the Western population as well. There have also been significant changes in anaphylaxis triggers over time. For example, in Hong Kong in the 1990s to 2000s, drugs were the major causes of anaphylaxis in that period. However, in the year 2015, this had changed to food instead. In Singapore, in the same time period in the 1990s to 2000, bird's nest was the major allergen. However, this had moved on to shellfish by the year 2015 as well. So it is postulated that perhaps variable um, factors in the environment may have contributed to this change, such as epigenetics or dietary factors or other environmental triggers that have been yet unmeasured. Next, I will move on to discuss some anaphylaxis outcomes. This table shows the anaphylaxis management from countries such as in Europe, Australia, and Canada. As you can see, the rates of epinephrine, which is the first line management for anaphylaxis, varies considerably between populations. The use of epinephrine was only 28% in Europe, but was as high as 71% in Canada. The use of gl glucocorticoids were also variable, being quite high in Europe, and antihistamines were relatively less used. This table shows anaphylaxis management that was used in all the Asian countries in this uh, table here. There was also relatively low usage of epinephrine in many countries, as low as 20 to 30%, whereas in other countries, it would range from as high as 70 to 80%. There was also high usage of glucocorticoids and antihistamines in many of the Asian countries. Next, this is table shows the prevalence and risk factors of biphasic anaphylaxis. There are no major differences between Asian countries and the Western countries in terms of the prevalence of biphasic anaphylaxis, which ranges from about 0.5 to as high as 5, 5 to 7%. Some of the risk factors that were identified in some studies included male, gender, seafood, or drug-induced anaphylaxis, or multiple doses of epinephrine required. However, in many other studies, no definite predictors could be identified. Here I will talk about some unique anaphylaxis triggers that have been identified in Asian countries. This was a case series from Japan where patients who were using hydrolyzed wheat protein containing facial soaps reported incidences of wheat allergy and food dependent exercise induced urticaria and anaphylaxis. And this was postulated to be due to epicutaneous sensitization, even though they were healthy adults with an intact skin barrier. Further characterization of the causative allergens uncovered specific proteins in wheat which were responsible for these reactions, such as the omega gliadins and high molecular weight glutenins. Galacto oligosaccharide allergy has also been described in many Asian countries. Gauss are carbohydrates which are added to commercially available food products and beverages as prebiotics for the promotion of gut health. Allergic reactions were actually first reported in Japanese oyster sharkers who develop anaphylaxis after consumption of gauze supplemented lactic acid beverages. And this was later shown to be the result of cross reactivity between gauze and the Hoya antigen, which was derived from the sea squirts present on oyster shells. Subsequently, similar reactions were also reported in cow's milk tolerant children in Vietnam and Singapore after consumption of gauze containing milk formula. And these patients were found to be sensitized to short-chain gauze, but not to cow's milk in itself. 
These reactions have been found to be more commonly occurring in atopic individuals, and the prevalence of gauze allergy is estimated to be around 3.6% in the atopic Singaporean population. The primary sensitizer for gauze is not well described, but is postulated to be cross-reactivity to Blomia tropicalis, which is a dust mite unique in this region. Several other anaphylaxis episodes have been described to food delicacies. Asia is a, is, a, is a region enriched for its culinary delights, and therefore anaphylaxis has been described to unique food allergens, such as in silkworm pupa, chrysanthemum tea, bullfrogs, locusts, and cecida as well. And as I mentioned before, bird's nest anaphylaxis was one of the major triggers in Singapore in the last two decades. There is also an entity termed as oral mite anaphylaxis, where house dust mite allergic patients develop anaphylaxis from the consumption of dust mite contaminated flour in baked goods, such as in pancake or pastries, as well as cakes. So in summary, food-induced anaphylaxis is the commonest cause of anaphylaxis in children. And rates of anaphylaxis have been rising over time in both the East and the West, and the rates have been quite similar. Changes in predominant allergens are also evident. The triggers of anaphylaxis, however, differ between regions, where wheat and walnut are very common allergens in Japan and Korea. Shellfish anaphylaxis predominates in Southeast Asia, and this is different from the West, where peanut and tree nuts are still the number one major allergens in many Western countries. There are also unique food triggers present, present in Asia. Adrenaline as the first line treatment is still underutilized in many Asian and Western populations. So there is an urgent need for standardized protocols for collection of anaphylaxis data around the world to accurately assess the true anaphylaxis burden. And this will help us to identify target areas for education, research and development of health policies around the world. And these are my acknowledgements. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Watsu Kamchai Satyan, a pediatric allergist and immunologist from Samitivate Children's Hospital. Bangkok, Thailand. Today, today I will be delivering uh, the lecture on periodic asthma, the importance of multidisciplinary care team. This is for lecture for the Apache 2021 International Conference. Asthma is a chronic airway inflammation in which many cell and cellular elements play a role. It associates with airway hyperresponsiveness. And the clinical manifestation can be controlled with appropriate treatment to prevent the exacerbation. Asthma is a complex disease. It can be affected for the genetic and epigenetic, the innate and adaptive immune response, the interaction with uh, microbiome, viral infection, the of exosome such as allergen or provision, and also with the epithelial barrier. This uh, result in the airway inflammation in the asthma. This is the pathway state of the asthma. You can see from the left picture is the uh, bronchial biopsy from the healthy uh, individual. You can see that the epithelial lining is still intact and no inflammatory cell infiltrate in the submucosal area. But in the middle and the right picture is the bronchial biopsy from uh, patient with my tumor and severe asthma, you can see that they have a shading of the epithelial lining, the infiltration of the inflammatory cell in the submucosal area, the submucosal gland hyperplasia, and with the airway smooth muscle cell hyperplasia as well. Uh, the prevalence of asthma is increasing worldwide. This is a study uh, survey from the World Health Organization about 20 years ago, that uh, and found that uh, about one fifth of the total, uh, total population worldwide have suffering from some form of allergic disease. And this is the test from the asthma children or uh, asthma in the past decade, especially the group of the younger than 20 years old. The, you can see that the socio demographic uh, index especially the low uh, group still have very high uh, 
high rate of the death and also the year of life loss of for the asthma. The burden of childhood asthma can result in the long-term individual health status, the decline lung function, the quality of life uh, children and their family, and the cost of medication that result in the economic loss, especially the developing country. The diversity of pediatric asthma uh, can uh, depend on the age of onset, the phenotype of the asthma, the severity of the asthma, and the level of asthma control, and also with the comorbidity such as the allergic rhinitis, rhinosinusitis, other allergic diseases such as atopic dermatitis, food allergy, also with the other sleeping disorder and obstructive sleep apnea and the psychiatric disorder. The principle of asthma management consists of pharmacotherapy, education, the trigger avoidance, monitoring, and immunotherapy. This is the result in the healthcare cost burden. And there are several international standard guidelines such as China National Asthma Education and Prevention Program, ICON, the British and Scottish uh, guidelines, as well with our local Thai pediatric asthma guideline. The asthma care children, uh, asthma is one of the leading cause of hospital visit in children and the healthcare cost burden. In the emergency room department, the time to evade the treatment is critical, especially children with asthma intervention. This delay can lead to the poor outcome and unnecessary hospitalization. It was shown that implementation of standard clinical pathways can improve the adherence to the evidence-based standard. And overall, we observed improvement in asthma control, airway inflammation, quality of life, and real problems suggest that the multidisciplinary uh, team, care team is a useful approach for the heterogeneous group of children with asthma that remain uncontrolled in healthcare setting. So our hospital uh, have developed this clinical care program for childhood asthma. We have a team called Summitive Sinakalin Pediatric Asthma Care Team or S2PAC, consists of pediatric allergists, pediatric pulmonologists, pediatric nursing staff, the pharmacist, physiatrists, and physical therapists. These are helped in the team, and the objective of our clinical care program is to provide the special terror track for their childhood asthma care with multidisciplinary care team to deliver continuum of care according to the standard international guidelines to minimize management and treatment variation among healthcare providers, to reduce the risk of the care process, and to provide the continuous holistic care for asthmatic uh, patients and family in terms of education for the self-care management, prevention of the asthma exacerbation, risk reduction, rehabilitation, and we also to gather this health information to for the process of quality improvement. Our the job description of uh, our uh, care team, the pediatric allergies and pulmonologists will help set up the consensus protocol according to the standard guideline and act as the attending or consulting staff and payroll in the program management and quality improvement. The general pediatrician will help participate in the attack as the attending physician in taking care of the asthmatic children comply to the hospital policy and the asthma care plan mm -hmm. and update to the knowledge of the standard guideline. Our nursing staff, pediatric nursing staff, will help for the initial assessment and triage for the acceptable uh, patient starting the nursing care according to the our clinical care program. Activate our team for the outpatient or the inpatient uh, in case there is any uh, asthmatic children come in and prepare all the documents according to the care plan, the infra hospital transfer assessment form the patient family education about the knowledge and medication use. 
and we also have the nurse coordinator will help facilitate and set up the consent of protocol, educate the patient and family about the nature of disease, uh, payroll and facilitate the program and quality improvement. The pharmacy will help uh, for the prepare of the medication needs for the patient in the, uh, the asthma care program. Inform and educate the patient about the long term use of this medication. Advise about the home medication for the patient and caregiver for their indication, the instruction, possible side effects, and drug interaction, and to assess and evaluate the drug related problem during the follow up patient. For the physiatrist and physical therapist, they will help with the consulting for the breathing exercise if indicated. And this is our clinical care plan day for the childhood asthma. We use the grade of recommendation according to the recommendation strength and grade of evidence. We start with the acute visiting that come to the emergency room of the outpatient triage by the nurse or doctor and put on the standing order for the treatment of the acute visiting side. When they get better, they can get discharged from the hospital and our team will help uh, to make uh, confirm the diagnosis of asthma and start the treatment according to the our book uh, uh, care pathway and to uh, follow up uh, for this patient to uh, whether they have the clinical asthma control or not and adjust the medication and eventually uh, we will try to all medication for after they have no exacerbation for at least one year and follow up the patient regularly later on. For patients uh, with still have uh, clinical asthma and control, this patient may need to get a consultation for the pediatric allergies or pulmonologies for further evaluation. And we will help to perform the allergy skin testing, uh, pulmonary function test, and give the flu vaccination. But for the patient, we still have the frequent exacerbation. This group of patients may need to con get the consulting for the breathing exercise. This is the acute thing, breathing care pathway that we use in the work program. And we also have the triage scale for asthma and the clinical asthma score for the patient at the initial and after uh, for the get the uh, treatment at the emergency room of uh, our patient. And we also have the high-risk uh, group the uh, back back side for the asthma asthmatic student who will uh, may have the high uh, or severe XL exacerbate such as having moderate to severe symptoms, having history of uh, asthma exacerbate with respiratory failure, need incubation or critical care unit. And then also I have having history using a high dose inhaled steroid or recently taking a lot of steroid or having suspect other complications such as pneumonia or arteriosclerosis. This is the diagnostic uh, form that we use in our program and the treatment uh, algorithm for uh, the, uh, treating the asthmatic children. And we also have the uh, assessment at the follow-up to check for the regular use of the controller medication, the correct use of the inhaler technique, the environment control checklist, the uh, assess for the comorbidity, uh, and also to assess the clinical asthma control and minimal side effect from the medication. The clinical asthma control that we uh, uh, characteristics that we will uh, use uh, such as night, no night symptom, no day symptom, no need for the liver medication use, or no extra exacerbation. And we also have the clinical criteria for getting consulting uh, patients for the specialist such as young breathing children, difficult to treat asthma, or having history or high risk or near fatal asthma or need for allergy testing or allergen immunotherapy. And we also have the self-management plan at home for asthmatic students. Uh, it includes with the trigger uh, topic of trigger for the asthma attack, 
the environmental control the risk factor the medication use and how to mitigate when they have been asthmatic attack at home this is the asthma action plan for the outpatient and the inpatient this is the asthma medication instruction and the booklet for the asthmatic patient and we also have the environmental control checklist for the patient you come to follow up you uh, have the session for the patient and family uh, education in the term of the use of inhaled medication and other environmental control uh, education. And for the inpatient, uh, be the nurse coordinator and the pharmacist will visit the patient within 24 hours for re-educate and identify the risk factor with uh, whatever the aggravate the symptom, uh, the patient symptom for the hospitalization. And our program also have the asthma education for the community. We have the, we develop the childhood asthma camp, which focus on the education for the disease, the drug use, the lung function, the mental control, the asthma action plan, the breathing exercise, we have conduct this asthma, childhood asthma camp since 2012 and perform, uh, conduct this uh, education uh, annually from 2012 until now with uh, during the pandemic of COVID-19. We submit this uh, physical asthma camp to the virtual asthma camp instead. And we also have the asthma week campaign in our hospital. And for the performance measurement of clinical care program, our clinical care program, since 2012 until uh, this uh, now, we already have 331 patients in our uh, program. About 67% are boys, and about 59% are children uh, less than five years old. And we also collect the performance measurement in the term of process indicator such as the compare rate of uh, the prescription of systemic steroid for hospitalized uh, asthmatic children within 12, uh, 12 hours. The compare rate of the patient who come to follow up and demonstrate the use of the inhaler medication correctly. The compare rate of assessment to make function care annually the compare rate of prescription for the pro vaccination for the diabetic children annually. This is our outcome for the this project indicator, the hospitalized, uh, the systemic steroid during hospitalized within 12 hours. The collect uh, demonstrate use collect uh, collecting use of the inhaler medication. The only function care pro, uh, performing, performing annually and the flu shock uh, to the asthmatic children uh, annually. And then we, uh, in the past three years, we switch, uh, uh, proceed to collect the clinical outcome uh, indicator in the term of the, to see whether the children, uh, asthmatic children will have the relapse asthma exacerbation within three months or not. The rate of childhood asthmatic patients who have the clinical asthma remission after stopping controller medication for at least one year. And the rate of childhood asthmatic patients who have the abnormal pulley function test. And the asthmatic children who got the flu shot and still have the flu injection. This is the outcome, uh, the first of the relapse asthma within three months. Clinical asthma remission for, uh, uh, for our children, uh, asthmatic children in our program. The rate of abnormal fully function test and the rate of uh, asthmatic children who receive the flu shot and still develop the flu infection. So our clinical care program, asthmatic children hostel have all uh, received the accreditation from the Joint Commission International uh, from the USA since 2012. This is the first clinical care program outside USA that's certified by this uh, uh, JCI. 
and we also received the triennial reaccreditation in 2015, 2018, and last recently this year in uh, 2021. And we also have the plan for continued improvement for the clinical care program for childhood asthma. We will have the childhood asthma camp for patient and family yearly. And we will improve for the actual for the asthma treatment with the use of the electronic uh, platform we call the pediatric asthma e care. And we will have the use the tool for assess the clinical asthma control and the tool for monitoring asthma in airway inflammation and the screening tool for the young children uh, we use for the uh, impulse oxidometry and the tool for educating about the allergen avoidance. This is the tool, first tool that we use, we use for the asthma e-care. For the patient who come in our hospital, uh, the doctor will uh, register the patient information, the medication use, and we also have the link for the video teaching for the uh, inhaler use for the patient. For the patient, they can log into this uh, platform and they can uh, access the clinical asthma control weekly by uh, checking all this information. And here they can see that the better the children have the uh, asthma control in the green, the yellow, or in the red zone. And they can see this call and not uh, weekly and also have they can list uh, to the link of the teaching video for inhaler device use. And for the asthma airway information, we will have the using the echolytic oxide to determine uh, early determine for the modeling of the airway information. And for the preschool children with uh, uh, visiting, we will uh, use another tool we call the impulse oscillometry spirometry that will help to make sure the uh, make the uh, early diagnosis for the uh, asthma in the preschool children. So in conclusion, the implementation of asthma care pathway will help improve the efficiency of the hospital care, reduce the variability in practice, and ensure the adherence to the high quality uh, standard international guideline. And with using the multidisciplinary team report, including the pulmonologist and allergist, the pediatric nurse, the pharmacist, and physical therapist, we result in improvement of the clinical outcome in the childhood asthma in the term of reduced asthma exacerbation, adhere to the treatment clinical asthma control and remission, and the modifying risk factor, including the lung function. Thank you for your attention. Hi, my name is Kang Mo An from Korea. I will be de delivering a lecture on food allergy in children in Asia Pacific for the Apache 2021 International Conference. My lecture will discuss the present and future of food allergy in our region. In relation to this presentation, I declare that there are no conflicts of interest. Let me start with the prevalence of a current food allergy in Asia. In infants, the overall prevalence ranges from 3% to 6%. The most common food allergens are cow's milk and hen's egg. In the UK and the US, prevalence of peanut allergy is found to be over 1% even in this age group. In preschool aged children, the most common food allergens are still cow's milk and hen's egg. Shellfish allergy is commonly found in Southeast Asia, while the prevalence of peanut allergy in the US is 1.8%. In school-aged children, it is noticeable that in Southeast Asia, the prevalence of a shellfish allergy is high, but peanut allergy is not common. By contrast, in the Western countries such as the UK and the US, the prevalence of peanut allergy is high, whereas shellfish allergy is not as frequently found as 
in Southeast Asia. Consumption of shellfish, including crustaceans and mollusks, is very popular in Asia. Uh, various allergens in shellfish have been reported so far. One of the major allergens in crustacean species is a highly heat-stable protein, tropomyosin. Tropomyosin also acts as a major allergen in mollusk species and is cross-reactive with tropomyosin in crustacean species. Fish allergy is frequently found in Asia as well. Major allergen in fish is known to be uh, pavadumin, a heat-stable protein. Of interest, heat level proteins in fish, such as collagen and vitellogenin, also act as allergens in Asian fish allergy patients because some Asians, particularly Koreans and Japanese, eat raw fish and fish roe. Uh, this is another unique finding in Asia. In Korea, an anaphylaxis registry was set up and the anaphylaxis patients visiting hospitals have been registered. According to the report from the Multicenter Anaphylaxis Registry, major triggers in food-induced anaphylaxis are hen's egg and cow's milk in Korean children younger than 18 years and shrimp in Korean adults. It is notable that walnut, pine nut, buckwheat, and wheat are listed as frequent triggers in food-induced anaphylaxis in Korea. What makes this difference between Asian and Western countries? To our understanding, it is because we are different races with distinct genes, we have different dietary habits, and we are in different level of industrialization and urbanization. And I think such a difference will make food allergy patterns in Asia keep changing in the future. In other words, with more industrialization and urbanization, our lifestyles will be more westernized, hygiene will be more improved, and we will have increased level of pollution. One more thing we have to think about is climate change. Apache has already recognized that air pollution, climate change, and reduced biodiversity are major threats to human health. In its white paper published in 2020, it was stated that the extent of air pollution and climate change, including global warming, is increasing to alarming proportions, particularly in the developing countries or rapidly industrializing countries worldwide. In this regard, I'd like to touch several issues we have faced soon in our region. The first issue is whether the food allergy prevalence will increase in Asian countries. Uh, Dr. Prescott and Dr. Allen published a review article exactly 10 years ago uh, saying that food allergy has recently emerged over the last 10 to 15 years as a second wave of the allergy epidemic, lagging decades behind the first wave of asthma, allergic rhinitis, and inhalant sensitization. In this article, they argued that environmental change, epigenetic change effects, and failure of oral tolerance might be the reason. Indeed, the prevalence rates of a peanut allergy in the UK and the US increased, especially in children. We also seen a rapid increase in food allergy in Australian children. The National Child Health Services data in the US showed the uh, increase in food allergy and skin allergy, while the prevalence of respiratory allergy has decreased during the same time period. In addition, it should be noted that gene environment interactions in Asians may be different from those in the Western people. Here are two interesting studies. Peanut allergy was more common among infants with parents born in East Asia compared to infants 
with two Australian born parents. Asian children born in uh, Australia to Asian born mothers were more likely to have a nut allergy than no, non Asian children and children born in Asia uh, who subsequently migrated to Australia. Uh, these observations suggest that Asians may be more susceptible to food allergy development when exposed to a uh, Western environment. Taken together, uh, food allergy is expected to increase in Asian countries. The second question is whether food allergy in our region will become more severe or more persistent. Data from Australia indicate that there has been a marked increase in hospitalizations due to food-induced anaphylaxis between 1994 and 2005. This phenomenon is more pronounced in children aged 0 to 4 years. In the U.S., the rate of emergency department visits for food-induced anaphylaxis increased by 124% between uh, 2005 and 2014. A multi-center study in Hong Kong also found that hospital and emergency department admissions for food-induced anaphylaxis in children have already increased between 2000 and 2015, especially in children aged 0 to 4 years. The most common trigger was peanut followed by seafood, eggs, cow's milk, or dairy products, tree nuts, and seeds. In my opinion, uh, there is an increasing risk of a peanut or tree nut allergies in our region for several reasons. If so, the findings observed in Hong Kong may occur in Asia as a whole. This study was done in the U.S. and published in 2007 to look at the natural course of a cow's milk allergy, which was previously regarded as almost a transient with resolution in the preschool years. In this study, rates of a persistence were 58% at age 8 years and 36% at age 12 years, demonstrating that cow's milk allergy commonly persists into late childhood and adolescence. Our recent study in Korean children with cow's milk allergy also showed that only half of the cases resolved by age 9 years. Although there are some limitations, it can be assumed that severe food allergy such as food-induced anaphylaxis are likely to increase and the risk that food allergy persists into adolescence will increase. The next issue I'd like to talk about is pollen food allergy syndrome. As you know, a pollen food allergy syndrome is a type 2 food allergy which occurs by cross-reactivity between pollen allergens and food allergens, especially fruit. In Korean children, prevalence of a fruit allergy was estimated to be 1.41%. In another Korean study, prevalence of a pollen food allergy syndrome among 648 polynosis patients reached up to 41.7%. 8.9% of pollen food allergy syndrome patients even showed systemic symptoms like anaphylaxis. Importantly, we are facing climate change and air pollution, which may affect the seasonal allergic diseases due to longer pollen seasons and increase in pollen production as well as allergenicity. It means that we may have increased both allergic sensitization and symptom prevalence with severity including allergic rhinitis and pollen food allergy syndrome. 
Maybe we should pay attention to insect allergy as an emerging food allergy as well. Edible insects are a highly nutritious food and have frequently consumed as a food source in many regions of the world, depending on cultural and religious practices. Food and Agriculture Organization is expecting that insects emerge as an issue in the 21st century due to the rising cost of animal protein, food and feed insecurity, environmental pressures, and population growth. It is known that allergic reactions to edible insects occur either de novo or cross-reactivity, especially with tropomyosin. We understand that shellfish allergy is more common in Asian than in the Western countries, and its major allergen is tropomyosin. If insects are more frequently consumed for several reasons in the future, we may observe more patients with insect allergy in our region. What is the solution to prepare for the future? Perhaps allergen immunotherapy or primary prevention are the answers. Recently, Dr. Gary Wong's group summarized very well oral immunotherapy or OIT studies or of different food allergens from Asia. Many of them were performed in Japan and the target foods were wheat, eggs, and cow's milk. Unlike the Western countries with a high prevalence of a peanut allergy, it is not surprising that the target for OIT in our region should be different. At present, our targets are more likely to resolve spontaneously and OITs are not routinely recommended because of safety issues and limited effectiveness. If the prevalence of these food allergies increases in the future, the incidence of anaphylaxis increases and spontaneous resolution are delayed or even decreases, perhaps we should consider allergen immunotherapy more aggressively than now. As the pathogenesis of a food allergy has been revealed, we have more interests in primary prevention. Guidelines for peanut allergy prevention have been proposed in Western countries. North America and Australia recommend active intervention by introducing peanut-containing foods at around four to six months of age. In contrast, the UK recommends just weaning at around six months without differentiating peanut from other solid foods. Likewise, Japan recommends weaning at five to six months of age and no food should be excluded. Uh, regarding primary prevention of a food allergy in our region where the peanut allergy prevalence is very low, a papari consensus statement was published uh, from the uh, Asian perspective. Uh, for healthy infants, there is no need to change uh, current feeding guidelines, including introduction of uh, complementary foods at six months of age. For at-risk infants with a family history of atopy, it is recommended that the introduction of allergenic foods should not be delayed. For high-risk infants with severe eczema, test for egg allergy needs to be done first because Egg is the most common food allergens found in Asia. If challenge negative, introduction of the uh, allergenic foods into the infant's regular diet is recommended beginning as early as four months, but ideally not later than 10 months of age. At present, a current strategy for primary prevention of a food allergy in our region is not aggressive. However, in the future, 
more active intervention may be required depending on the regional circumstances. Now, this is my last slide. Uh, so far, I've talked about the present and future of food allergy in Asian countries. Regular monitoring of food allergy pattern in our region is needed. More active intervention may be required in the future. Thank you for listening.